Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 3 of our Let's Learn series for Victoria 3 where we are playing as Portugal, a minor power that rightfully deserves to be a major or even a great power one day and we will attempt to take it there. This is a slow playthrough where we will go over each and every mechanic in detail and see how kind of the key game loops in Victoria 3 and I would say there's two major ones which is economy and politics how they interplay each other and how every little decision from for example building a building actually translates and kind of trace trace it through all the various changes that are happening in our country to help you guys learn how to think about assessing your nations and achieve your geopolitical objectives uh, you know through building up your economy and steering the politics of your nation now we have spent the first two episodes the first two hours on just a general overview of what is this nation of portugal in 1836 what does it look like what does it have what does it not have what does the population look like kind of budget and politics we spent the second episode going state by state to see what uh you know what does the country kind of look like in summary i think what we have decided is that look we have three incorporated states in western europe kind of the core historical portugal uh right inhabited by portuguese this will be our uh, you know, these are the most populous states uh, and importantly they're inhabited by you know, Portuguese so 1.6 million 800,000 and 300,000 right so that's about yeah almost half of our population lives here uh, we will probably build our manufacturing base here and then use our colonies to feed us with any natural resources we need we do have some natural resources here iron mines and coal mines in Alenteo our southern province however it is suffering from a relatively uh, kind of low population and relatively low infrastructure so we'll be mindful as to what we build here and hopefully only occupy building slots with iron mines and coal uh, you know in the next kind of five ten years as we start begin our industrialization journey for now though our priority number one would be in our most populous uh, state of Bre Beira we have 34,000 unemployed to that end we have ordered to build two or well, actually three logging camps and a, and a construction sector here why because these buildings are quick to build and they will reduce the price of wood by building more logging camps uh, alleviating the strain on our budget from buying the wood required to finance the construction sector uh, right and also we would then build another construction center to again improve that demand and then build more logging camps to uh, again produce, produce more supply of wood in our economy reducing the price of wood will also help uh, buildings like glassworks that are just about profitable but if you reduce the price of wood then perhaps um you know they will actually turn into a profitable building helping our pops you know get their wages and stay employed and at least maintain or maybe even increase their standard of living to that end we're also put in a queue one logging camp building in our capital state we then have the states, kind of the little states of Azores Islands, Madeira Islands, and Cap Verde that are mostly inhabited by Portuguese settlers. Um, there are a lot of them, but that's still 360,000 in between them. No major resources here, so we're kind of thinking, do we incorporate these, or do we instead benefit from the 20% penalty, 20% uh, bonus to throughput of basic resource and agriculture buildings that we get because we are focused on colonial exploitation as a policy in our laws. We are then colonizing kind of our footholds of you know, Gambia in Western Africa, and then in kind of, kind of Central Africa, I guess, we are colonizing Southern Angola, having already established and fully colonized North Angola. In East, on the East African coast, uh, we are holding Portuguese Lorenco Marquez, and we're splitting that state with this nation, if we can call it that, uh, or this collection of tribes of Gaza. We'll see how we deal with them. And we continue to um, um, colonize Zambezia and Mozambique. These uh, states do have some iron and coal, so they will be important to colonize and control fully in order to supplement our domestic supply of iron and coal and further fuel uh, our industrialization. Then our colonies Nova Goa, Macau and Sunda Islands, we just kind of had to hold them, especially you know, Nova Goa and Macau. And other than that, you know, Sunda, 
maybe we try to contest them with the Dutch. We'll see. Perhaps the Dutch could turn turn out to be our main rival, to be honest. We'll kind of have to see. Let's just kind of set on that strategy, you know, to the end, to that end, we kind of, we, so we set up some buildings in order to deal with unemployment uh, and, you know, and reduce the price of wood, as I've talked about. And we have also set our colonial institution to grow to level two. Uh, and we have set our research to pharmaceuticals and then followed up at quinine. This will help our population growth uh, by improving healthcare and quinine will remove the 90% colonial growth penalty for states uh, infested with malaria. Uh, so to that end, I guess we are actually ready to unpause. Let's unpause at speed two and just see wh what's kind of happening in the world. So Majratine are improving relations. Now, who are they? Culture Somali. Let's have a look. So this is, okay, on the this is Horn of Africa, I think that's called, right? Philippines is improving relations with us. Okay. Overlord Spain. Wow, really? I didn't actually know Philippines was influenced by Spain. Great Britain has established a colony, British Kenya. Uh, okay, but the Philippines are actually a centralized state, right? It's just that uh, Governor General Pedro Antonio Veras. So they are, I was just over there, diplomacy. So they're a puppet, a puppet of Spain. Interesting. I never knew that. Wow, yeah, Spanish, the remnants of the Spanish Empire. Banjar are improving relations with us. Who are they? Okay, their overlord is Dutch East Indies. Okay, Congo have started to improve relations with us. Okay, Zidora, Sulu, Bhutan, Surakarta, Kutch, Western Australia improving. Okay, okay, fine. Now, why don't we pause ourselves? First of all, let's have a look. What are the British doing? Okay, so British have landed on the East African coast. So yeah, as I mentioned, we kind of need to be fast about our colonizing. Yeah, and see, they uh, they already have quinine researched. So their colonies are growing, you know, at 584 days. They're taking over a little province every 580 days. Although, actually, I think the reason for this is it's not because they have quinine research. It's because they have such a massive population themselves. So, which, so the way colonization works, Right, so for us, we can establish a colony in any decentralized state in the world that we kind of have access to. You'll see there are not many left anymore. Well, no, actually. So here we can't colonize because we need an interest. Uh, we just have claims and interests, yeah. So only those that, okay, I guess, don't have a sort of claim or interest from another country. So in Africa, there's a few places, let's say, we could colonize. Um... And the way colonization works is that every set number of days we gain, for example, right now, 0.1 colonial growth generation, the amount of colonial growth generated by POPs in incorporated states. So, so you know, the population that we have in incorporated states, that's uh, right, the sort of three, 3 million or so, we get 0.1 colonial growth per, per POP. Uh, right, 0 0.2 with level 2 institution, uh, right, and that gets translates into colonization, right? and that then suffers from a 90% penalty. Now, Britain obviously has, uh, if we just put, go to the ledger, Great Britain has a population of 27.2 million as opposed to our six and a half. That's why, even without quinine, they're probably um, colonizing this much faster. Okay, so something to keep an eye on. However, I just wanted to go quickly to it the diplomatic lens, and at the bottom here. There's basically two ways to do things in Resort okay, 3. We can either go state by state and pick what we build or what decree we issue, or we go through these lenses that let us take certain actions and also, you know, kind of change the map coloring to signify, you know, whatever is relevant. So in diplomatic lens, for example, regional actions, we can actually declare interests. We will declare an interest in Zanj. Yeah, we have a declared interest in Senegal in West Africa. In Congo, we have an inherent interest just like we do in Iberia, because we have uh, a fully, full kind of states there, even incorporated or unincorporated, right? So we already, Portugal has, already has an interest in Iberia, and we already have an interest in Congo. We also have an interest in South Africa. Uh, inherent interest in South Africa, why is that? 
keep forgetting. Oh, right. it's because of uh, this, yeah. Portuguese Lorenco Marquez. Yeah, so that's... Yeah, that's in... Yeah, that's in South, Southern Africa. Interesting. So if we declare an interest in Zanj, once we actually establish our colonies there, we won't need to spend our kind of strategic region declaration there. We'll just have a natural interest there. Same with once we colonize Gambia. Um, so that's something for your kind of in diplomacy to do. Now, we can actually try and establish colonies. Now, all of our col colonial growth gets divided equally between our, you know, places where we're actually establishing colonies in. So we have to be mindful. Like, we can't just click on, like, every single green thing right now. Uh, and I guess Kenya we would be... But let's have a look here. Is it worth... Is it worth to colonize any of this at all? So let's think about it. What, what, what are the British after in Kenya, to be really honest? Just not that. There's some population. Not, not, much, not much resources here. Not, let's have a look. What else? We could get Douala. A Douala, what does that have? Logging camps and fishing. Yeah, not really worth rushing for it, for sure. I mean, it's always nice to get population that we can tax, but otherwise, not much. What else do we have? Oh, the French are here in Annie. Hmm. This is kind of this state. Now, we could crew. What does that have? That actually has iron. So, crew has iron. What about Susu or... Oh, France is also in here, and Britain is in here. Dearie me. So Mauritania. This guy's iron. And whaling stations. Mm. So this would actually... It's got Sahel Desert, though. Minus 10% agriculture and plantations through it. Plus 10% ranches throughput. Mm. So we could get Mauritania. Split state. Yeah, you know, it's Charza maybe. Yeah, and some sort of inner Mauritania. So it's got iron, and to be honest, a lot of iron as well. Hmm. So does crew as well. Interesting. So do so. The question here for us in terms of our colonization: Do we want to grab Mauritania? It's also Senegal. What does Senegal have? Sorry, hang on. Also has iron and sulfur even. Uh, no wonder the French are already here. Hang on. Yeah, France, French, Senegal, Kayor. Okay, so France has kind of put a foothold here, so we don't want to necessarily compete with them. We can maybe take that over from them at some later date. Do we want to be a crew here then? Potentially. Windward coast. Iron. I guess we're... Yeah, so... I mean, the good... It would be great to kind of get a foothold, but we also don't want to split ourselves too thin. Denmark is even in here. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin. We're already 11,000. It would take us 5,000 days, so we desperately... Yeah, perhaps we just focus on these for now in South Angola and we'll see. Yeah, let's not spread ourselves too thin. Although we do want to grab them, but it's not it's not imperative. We do have sources of iron. Right? And that's enough. Enough for now. Uh, what I did also want to do though, we do have influence here. We'll talk about the three resources in top left in a minute, but we do have influence. For example, let's start with that. So we have effects from 100% or more excess influence is that we have plus 25% infamy decay. Interesting. And so what happens when we colonize, so as I've talked in the previous episode, right, we're just kind of landing and encroaching upon the land of a decentralized nation, which doesn't have the will or kind of the power to protect its borders. But as we do that, it's, you know, it's not, we're not killing anyone. So we are taking over their population and territory slowly, but steadily. Well, we are generating tension. I want to see if it's actually possible to see how much tension we have with them. Tension, calm. The tension between us and Moravi is calm. Uh, us and Manika is also calm. Let's see, Ovi Bundu is also calm. So they're just kind of quietly, slowly acquiescing towards us taking them over. Now, as we continue to colonize, tension will rise. 
it I think it rises, I can't remember the quite exact value, but it also does decay at some level. So it kind of just balances, but it does rise slowly overall. Now, because we have colonial exploitations, so we're kind of going in there, right, just taking over land and exploiting it, we actually have minus 5% tension decay penalty. But because we have so much influence right now, so 100% excess or more uh, of what we use, and we are using 400 from to uh, maintain our defensive pact with Great Britain, our trade agreement with Great Britain, we actually have plus 25% infamy decay. So we're kind of negating the bonus, the, the malice from, uh, or the, right, the penalty from um, colonial exploitation. So actually, let's keep it that way. Let's not spend our influence because we could spend it to improve relations with someone, maybe get an alliance, but I don't think we need to. I don't think we need to. All right, we could improve our relations with Spain potentially. Um, but we don't particularly need to right now. So let's just leave that B. Let's leave that B and unpause. Just keep rolling. Now, mm, let's have a look. Current situations, low formation organization. Okay, that's because our troops must be missing small arms because they're very expensive. So we have expensive military goods, low standard of living in some states. We're going to ignore that for now. Expensive government goods of wood and paper. We are dealing with wood. We'll deal with paper later. Um, we have input good shortages. So let's go ahead and pause. And that's what I talked about. Oh, we also have an unacceptable government. We need to deal with that as well. South Wales improving relations. Okay. So let's get wound paused for, 20, for four weeks. And here we are. So wood shortage. Uh, right, so let's just read the tooltip here, see what that gives us. Input goods shortages. Buildings that consume goods will suffer an output penalty if less than 50% of the buy orders for those goods are satisfied. This is usually caused by insufficient availability of the good in the building's market, but may also be a result of low market access in the building state region. Yeah, so what this really means, if we go to the, our market and we look at the goods, we we'll look at the balance, and we see wood, and that's red thing, it says we have a shortage. Now, why? Because we have, only, we have only 170 cell orders, i.e. we only produce 170 wood, but we want 370 wood. Uh, well, you know, our buildings are required. So you can see population needs 191, construction sector 75, uh, and we will have another construction sector all the way. We have shipyards, we need another 39, military shipyards 35, and glassworks. All of these require wood, and we don't have a lot of wood. Uh, well, right now. So, but we're kind of building that up as quickly as we can. Now, having a shortage is not good. What can we do to alleviate that shortage? Let's think about this. So, again, Victoria 3 is a game of economy and politics. Economy can be divided into a domestic economy and international economy. So let's think about what can we do in our domestic economy. We can build extra levels of logging camps, right? So we're building three in Beira and one in Estemadura, right? It will take time to build them, but they will each create 5,000 jobs, right? They will create kind of maybe upskill our peasants or employ the unemployed or upskill our peasants into new jobs, improving their standard of living, uh, thereby giving us all sorts of positive effects, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. But other than uh, that, we could, you know, that will take time. What we could do is actually almost instantly increase our supply of wood by switching our production method in our logging camps to sawmills. Now, what does that do? And there's several production methods. They kind of deal with who owns the building, how, you know, whether it's automated, what kind of machinery is used to perhaps substitute labor. So use fewer people working there for more capital, i.e. sort of tools and machines. We can also change what kind of goods it produce or like, uh, the, the maybe some in this case it would produce you know, but we could switch to hardwood production entirely so don't produce any wood and produce hardwood instead sometimes some buildings kind of have a different mix so produce a little bit less wood and so with some hardwood kind of different very different mixes of goods but the main kind of the base production method is typically is kind of increases the efficiency so you get more output by using more in more capital inputs and here we could switch to sawmills right now we would require five tools and we would double the production of wood, right? Uh, and you'll see the wood here will get 60 more in total. That will reduce the price to a manageable 25. So it'll still be expensive, but at least reasonable, not too expensive. It will also reduce, remove the shortage. 
Uh, it would upskill 1,000 of our laborers into 1,000 machinists. But it would require 10 tools, which we do not have. It would make tools very expensive. Right? Uh, so kind of solve problem with wood, but create a problem with tools. We could build uh, two... You know, so what can we do with that? We could build a tooling workshop, right? Nothing stopping us from that. Uh, all we need, right? It will consume wood, <laughs> again, paradoxically, and produce tools, right? It would be probably profitable by then, since there would be demand for tools. It will, however, take 600 construction. It will take three times as long to build as it would to build three logging camps in that time. And why does that matter? Because this would give us 5,000 jobs in, let's say, if we produce, we will have 10 construction capacity in 60 weeks, as opposed to giving us 15,000 jobs in, in, uh, in the same time if we build three logging camps as we are doing now, right? And right now we need to get rid of this, uh, these unemployed as quickly as we can. Uh, so, it's not really worth it. We don't really have the time. It's not probably the most efficient thing to build a tooling workshop, although we would solve our wood problem. Um, so what other options do we have? We could switch to sawmills. We could import tools, right? That's an option. We would solve the, the tooling, um, tooling shortage in the meantime and produce more wood. That is an option, right? However, one other thing that switching to sawmills does is that it makes the building privately owned and that changes as to who in kind of the ownership class of the building and right now we are owned by mer run by merchant guilds and that provides 500 jobs to shopkeepers shopkeepers are owners and managers of stores selling wares to customers in cities they usually fall within the petite bourgeoisie politically so these guys are part of the middle strata and they support petite bourgeoisie, a little bit of industrialists and Catholics, right? Only pops with some wealth can become shopkeepers, potential increases with greater wealth. So there's no literacy requirement. You just need to have a certain wealth to actually become kind of a, a co-owner, I guess, or, you know, get yourself into a merchant guild and start running one of these industries, right? Clerks and farmers have a particularly easy time becoming shopkeepers. Now, if we switch to sawmills, we would be owned by capitalists, right? Now, capitalists are captains of industry and new money for a new era. As owners of mines and manufacturers, they contribute some of their profits to the investment pool. Their political interests are represented as the industrialists. We have no capitalists at the moment. So what is the good and bad, right? So the good thing is we would get capitalists, right? We would get 200 of them. They would support the industrial interest group. That kind of be determined whether that's a good or a bad thing. But another good thing about capitalists is that if we go to actually our nation, we go to these modifiers, so there are four ownership uh, class pops in the game. And those are upper class, you know, aristocrats and capitalists. They typically own buildings. Aristocrats tend to be the owners or like the, you know, yeah, the owners uh, of more agricultural buildings, right? Uh, whereas capitalists typically own kind of resource and manufacturing businesses or, or you know, industries. Also, however, shopkeepers can run... Uh, manufacturing and resource buildings and uh, right uh, it's kind of similar to capitalists and farmers can sometimes uh, run uh, uh, farms now the difference between these pops you know why this typically takes more of one or the other to actually uh, um, takes more of one or the other to uh, you know they so you need 500 shopkeepers to run let's say one level of logging camps uh, and it, but, but it takes, uh, you know, 100 capitalists to run the same building. Another difference is that different um, the different types of these ownership pops have a different investment pool contribution, right? What does that mean? That means capitalists, for example, take 20% of the profits of their building and reinvest it into the investment pool of the country, and which is then used for private construction right now you'll see we ordered to build logging camps but our private sector has actually decided to build some whaling stations in portuguese south angola and i have to say sometimes they make good decisions sometimes they make not so good decisions i'm not sure why this is necessarily a priority not sure meat or oil is actually really needed but that's what they decided to do with their investment pool we don't have no control over over it they do tend to go for kind of profitable or prospect yeah most pros yeah most profitable buildings most prospective buildings, but it is a bit random as to which one they pick exactly. 
So it's, I mean, I'd say it's useful most of the time, and it's exactly free construction, but the way it works is that our construction, for example, of 12 right now, gets split because we have interventionism. It gets split 50-50 between what we want to construct and the private sector. So we're actually only building at a speed of six, these logging camps in Beira, that are frankly, uh, fr frankly a priority. Um, but we split that with them. Now this investment pool, so capitalists contribute 20% of their uh, kind of ownership income of their dividends to that. Aristocrats contribute 10%, uh, while farmers and shopkeepers only contribute 5%. So the trade-off here of keeping our logging camps, uh, you know, it was just a simple forestry production method is that yes, we have 500 shopkeepers who support petite bourgeoisie and we don't produce a lot of wood. Or we switch to sawmills, we produce more wood, okay, we'll sort out our shortage uh, through trade of tools and we'll then build a tooling workshop later on, which should actually be a good thing because right, we create demand for tools and therefore can build kind of more higher skilled buildings, which will employ again people. Yes, it will take a long time to construct, but that's a solvable issue and ultimately that is actually a good thing. Uh, but we will lose 500 jobs, in fact, 400 jobs, and these guys will lose in standard of living and become most likely laborers, right? Again, or maybe clerks in other building, etc. Uh, so we will reduce the number of kind of rich people, right? So we skew the distribution of wealth in our nation kind of towards the top, well, towards, yeah, as you know, it gets concentrated among fewer people, uh, right? At the in the upper strata, and these guys will support industrialists. Now they will have a, contribute twenty percent of their profits. So if we have a look now, okay, so weekly balance, right, is one hundred one thousand eighteen hundred. Ownership dividends are one twelve, and reinvestment is fifty nine. So only five percent. This number would be five or four times larger if this building was owned by capitalists. Now that if we go to budget assets, our investment pool currently is twenty thousand, right? And we overall from all buildings owned by shopkeepers are uh, pulled in here at a rate of five thousand per week, right? And what right now one point six thousand is spent on construction and six point eight thousand is reinvested uh, right into the well kind of added to the pool. All right, so we can easily actually keep up one level of private construction, which is all really that our construction sector can afford to build, uh, while still increasing our investment pool. So that's kind of, what I would say, that that is enough. That's enough money in the investment pool. We just don't have the construction sector right now to support those capitalists, right? Yes, we would build up our investment pool faster with them, but it doesn't really make a difference because we can only spend so much at the same time because we can only build one building at a time right now. Because uh, apart from this sort of industrial capacity, or, uh, construction capacity of 12, it is actually limited by, again, we can go whenever I kind of looking for any modifier that's a bit obscure, you go to, you can go to the kind of country overview and go modifiers. And in here, we can find construction, see max weekly construction progress per one building is 25, right? The maximum amount of construction that a project can progress in a single week. So. We, if we have 25 construction, once we build that up, we'll still split that with the private sector and we'll build two buildings at the same time with a construction of 12 and a half in each. When we get to construction of 50, we will then, only then, we will be constructing both, you know, as I say, potentially a public building and a private building at the same time at full pace of 25. Or if we stop building public buildings, i.e. buildings with finance with government treasury, our private sector could build two buildings at the same time, right? Of course, at 50 capacity also, they would need to pay for many more, uh, well, five times as much input goods. So at that point, right, obviously our economy will be a lot bigger, but at that point, potentially, but if, if say that was the case right now, we would be spending all of our uh, investment pool you know, on construction and we would be in deficit and we would be depleting our investment pool faster than we can replenish it. And then I would argue, or I would pose it, that then it's useful to switch to capitalists, right? Because they would quadruple the amount that it gets put into the investment pool. At the beginning of the game, I would say we don't want capitalists, right? Why? Because we don't need the investment pool that we get from them. So we don't really benefit from that. We will suffer from the fact that, okay, 400 people are going to lose their jobs and likely 
uh, downscale, so to speak, or go down in strata and income and wages, right? And they will get radicalized. We'll talk about what that means in a second as well, but effectively they'll be unhappy and they will start to demand change. Um, whereas, and it will also skew, kind of put a lot of political power in capitalists, which will support industrialists. And again, we'll have a look at how governments and what interest groups are in a second. But um, industrialists, effectively, a very progressive group that start to demand very progressive reforms, which don't necessarily benefit a country in 1836, I would say, or rather, a country in 1836 with an underdeveloped industry is not able to take advantage of you know the laws that they want to pass, right? For example, like free trade, there isn't really that much trade going on, right? And we actually benefit from taxing it a little bit and helping ourselves kind of get ourselves kind of started in our industrialization by getting a bit of extra revenue in our treasury. That is why I personally don't like capitalists at the start. So I would say we keep it at simple forestry and instead suffer the shortage of wood, uh, right? But try to solve it over kind of the shorter term by building buildings. Uh, and also, also, you know, another thing again, so, so as I said, Victoria 3 is a game of economy and the politics, both of those uh, kind of uh, parts have a domestic and international part, the economy domestic part we just talked about. There's also an international part of the economy and that is trade. We, so we could go import trade route and just find some wood because we need plenty, right? As we've seen, right, in our market, we've got a huge deficit, right? We only have, we're only producing 170. We're building, you know, kind of three or four, four more logging camps. That will be 120 more. So that's 190, 290. We still have a shortage. Well, sort of a, it's like a shortfall. Well, not really short, a shortfall of 100. So why don't we go ahead, go wood uh, in trade. Have a look at productivity. And we could go British market, right? They're actually ready to uh, supply 100 wood for us, right? And that we will actually make money on that. We will not incur bureau uh, bureaucracy cost is zero. Number of convoys needed is zero because we have a trade agreement with them, right? So let's go ahead and establish this trade route. What this will also help us with is that it will create trade centers. As soon as that, it takes a bit of time for the trade route to get established and actually grow, kind of develop into that into that value of 100. So that screen just showed the potential. But as it develops, you know, we will actually create jobs and profitable jobs for more shopkeepers, which will again support the petite bourgeoisie. And petite bourgeoisie is a good, uh, interest group because it is a good stepping stone from a, you know, kind of the starting point of landowners typically across many nations, right? So we do want to reform, um, and we also it's actually laws that we can take full advantage of right now. That is what uh, kind of petit bourgeois supports. Again, we'll go in detail as to what interest groups are and which ones are kind of good or most beneficial to us. So that is why, and it's a question I got. Uh, you know, a common question in the f our first Let's Learn series with Serbia as to why don't I just switch to sawmills and fix the wood deficit? But no, it is not worth it. It it right, it radicalizes the population, creates kind of problems in the political uh, landscape or right? reforms too quickly, and yeah, it's much better to solve wood in other ways. Also, you know, if if we were right now, we have a kind of major surplus. But if we switch to sawmills, we wouldn't be able to build more logging camps, kind of in other provinces. And because you know each building would now produce sixty instead of thirty, right? And we don't want to build too many either. But I would actually keep it sort of fairly inefficient, because our goal is to just create jobs, right? Initially, just create as many jobs, and we kind of want to artificially lower the production in order to be able to build more levels. Now, that was going to take time, obviously, and construction cost, but it will, each level of these uh, logging camps will employ 4,500 people. And, you know, here it will employ unemployed, but in other states, like our capital state, it will upskill these peasants and improve the standard of living of those peasants, thereby making them more loyal. Right, so I would argue, keep it merchant guild, uh, rely on shopkeepers for the investment pool is more than enough at the start. You can't support more anyway. And yeah, just build more. Now, you know, there's kind of a temporary penalty. You'll see our whole industry is kind of screaming in our capital state. There is not enough wood for glassworks or construction sector or military shipyards or, or uh, 
um, just normal civilian shipyards, whatever they're called, just shipyards. Uh, but we will sort that through trade. You know, that's a better way. You know, that, that just benefits us. It doesn't cost us anything. We'll actually even improve our revenue, uh, government revenue through tariffs. So that is how we're going to sort that issue. Now, paper is also expensive. Why don't we go ahead and perhaps import some paper? Right, because it will be a while before we are able to actually build a paper manufacturer of our own. Um, for now, however, it's not a lot. No one really wants to trade. Yeah, so we don't want to establish and cancel a trade route. Uh, this will also cost us some bureaucracy. So this, I guess this is not great. We're just going to have to take the high price of paper for now. It's not crippling, uh, but we will build our own paper manufacturer, manufactory. Um, in some time probably in our capital state in fact i'm just going to go ahead and queue it up here just so we don't forget it will go to the end of our queue we'll probably we can rearrange our queue always later on but i would like to build it in our capital state probably mostly because we will build um, although no actually no we will build it in beira the reason for that We'll, we'll just we'll just yeah schedule schedule that here the reason for that is because as we remember when we did the overview of our states we're kind of running out of the station capacity here so we probably need a government administration here because we will need extra bureaucracy as we already talked about incorporating these islands you know that alone is about 80 bureaucracy plus the institution of colonial affairs that we're increasing and we know that once we research some text, we're going to have an extra institution in healthcare and then another extra institution in colonial affairs after that. So we will need extra bureaucracy, uh, right? So we can even go ahead and put that in here as well. Uh, it's against 400 construction kind of uh, building. We'll talk about it a bit in more detail, but it will produce, give us more bureaucracy, future proof us, give us a bit more taxation capacity. It will have a cost us one and a half thousand uh, from our treasury per week right so we'll put further strain so we need to make sure we actually have the national revenue to support that before we execute on that but also even if we just do have excess bureaucracy it does actually give us a little bonus that is quite useful right so again here so bureaucracy where does it come from we have 100 base value 101 from government administrations in Beira and 200 from two levels of government administration in Estremadura in our capital state where does it get used? It generally gets used just to support the population in incorporated states, right? 114 is used on institutions, and that will go up as we just talked about. One is used on trade routes. Uh, that's trade routes we establish ourselves, import or export, doesn't matter. Uh, so Portuguese market, Dutch market, iron export route. So for example, let's have a look. Um, market, trade routes, so iron. So we are exporting our iron to Denmark since we're not using any ourselves, uh, right? That's what we're using our bureaucracy on to maintain that trader. And we have two generals and one admiral in our employ, which uh, is using using up some bureaucracy. We could actually probably free that up a little bit. Do we really need two generals? General Luis Dorego Barreto. Uh, okay, let me just have a look quickly. We'll, Kind of talk about that a little bit later. Well, this guy is disliked anyway. He's 58, woodland combat expert, experienced colonial administrator as ruler. He will never be a ruler. This guy has a vast amount of experience around a colony. He's cruel. Why don't we go ahead and just retire, Commander? If relieved of command, Louis, the Rodrigo will lose their role as general and cease to affect the clout of the armed forces through their commander rank. Armed forces gets the commander at retirement, decaying for five years, minus one interest group of rule. I think that's fine. Let's go ahead and remove him. Free up some bureaucracy. Uh, we do have an admiral as well. Uh, yeah, I guess we do need to keep an admiral on staff for now. Fine, so we'll keep that. So we can just free up a little bit of bureaucracy there. So, you know, we generated from government administration. We spend it on basically servicing some trade routes and kind of key generals and admirals but mostly on servicing our population we do have 34 percent excess so we're using 300 but we generated 400 that's the 30 percent so 100 100 extra 
uh, on 300, right? So that's 30%. And that gives us a little bonus to state construction efficiency. So if we did build another government administration, it would raise our taxation capacity in Beira, which is kind of closing in on its maximum. And it would also, even if it is excess, uh, right? And we don't need it right now, we would, uh, you know, increase this um, bonus to about 10%. I think it maxes out at 10% state construction efficiency. That's effectively plus 10 uh, construction um, uh, in our states, right? So we don't get 12. We actually get a um, you know, an extra 1.2, which is kind of half of a construction, right? Because right now one construction sector gives us only two. Now, we've talked about influence and we've talked about bureaucracy, actually. We could actually talk about authority right now as well all right and where does authority is a third resource again here uh, we have 25 percent excess you already know how excess works so we're producing 750 and we're spending 600 so 150 over 60 that's the 25 percent and that gives us minus six percent law enactment time uh, we'll talk about that when we enact laws but effectively our the phases of law enactment process happen faster i think base is 150 out of 100 either 150 or 180 days uh we'll see and that will get reduced for example by six percent now where do we get authority from we mostly get it so 100 gets base value we mostly get it from laws you see so 200 from monarchy oligarchy national supremacy freedom of conscience and censorship conscience uh freedom of conscience and censorship so mostly laws and generally the more centralized more kind of authoritarian our state is the more authority we have where do we use it? Well, we use it to bolster Catholic Church and Petit Bourgeoisie, as we have clicked on in the first episode. Um, what does that mean? That means pops will get so in inside the game. Um, again, maybe we well, maybe we leave this for when we talk about interest groups. To be honest, uh, but for now, okay, we're basically making these interest groups slightly more attractive to pops, so which you know which makes them gravitate towards them. This only applies to pops who are actually kind of able or even kind of even think about supporting petite bourgeoisie uh, and that for example you know peasants will never support petite bourgeoisie nor will like servicemen soldiers things like that they're just not interested in petite bourgeoisie so no matter how much we bolster them they will it will not go up in clout so bolstering and suppressing i mean for now the important thing to understand is that you don't suppress an interest group to zero with su suppression nor do you bolster it infinitely with bolstering all you're really doing is that among, for example, shopkeepers, which tend to spread their political strength among several interest groups, right? And there's sort of base values built into the game as to where they spread it. They do prefer petite bourgeoisie, but they support others as well. But if we bolster petite bourgeoisie, it makes them more, more likely or like more of them, if we take like for every hundred or thousand shopkeepers, a higher percentage will support petite bourgeoisie. We're doing the same with Catholic Church. So for example, laborers or peasants, they can support rural folk, but quite a few of them support Catholic Church. Now that we're bolstering it, more of them will support the Catholic Church you know, than normal, right? Uh, and up to a certain kind of extent. We're also using authority to collect consumption taxes on liquor and coffee. Uh, so that's what we're using our authority on. Now, what else can we use it on, actually? And we could uh, use it on... Sorry, yeah, so our political lens. So we can use it on decrees. How much would that cost? It was cost only 100 authority. So we can go road maintenance uh, and pass that decree in Beira. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, because road maintenance gives plus 10% state construction efficiency. So we're, whatever we're constructing in this state would get plus 10%. So right now, if we were using the full 12, it would effectively give us an extra 1.2, which is pretty good. You know, that's almost a... You know, half the 60 percent of a construction uh sector right it's a pretty good bonus we're not using that authority for much anyway we're not enacting any laws so the little benefit that we do have is not really in use anyway right now it does also give plus one infrastructure per 100,000 population as we already talked about uh, up to a maximum of 20 all right so let's go ahead and spend our authority on that now so we've talked about that and we've discussed why we're simply going to build up logging camps and not switch to sawmills to sort out our deficit. We can't import more paper, so we can't do this kind of the same trick as we did with wood. Again, we've uh, explored why. So we explored all of this. 
Uh, we'll keep these kind of expanded, but we, at least we talked about all of these. Now, we do have an unacceptable government. Your government has 46 legitimacy, which makes it an unacceptable government. This is having an effect on the radicalization of your pops. All right, increase your legitimacy by adding or removing interest groups from your government. This can be done on the politics panel or on the details deals of an interest group. You can also change your laws, which can be done from the constitutional tabs in, pol in the politics panel. Now, why don't we talk about our government? We've had a look at what laws we have, what institutions have, and how they work in the first episode. But we skimmed over our government. And that is a big topic, obviously, given this is the second major loop. Or you know, one of the two major loop kind of gaming loops or you know, sent you know, kind of mechanical sensors, I don't know, uh, or major clusters of mechanics for Victoria 3. So it's very important to understand how it works and a little bit confusing. Now we have 14 minutes left of this episode, so I'm going to try to cram it into that 40 minutes. So here we are. Now, what is it? So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight interest groups in the game they are the same for all countries with a little bit of local flavor now obviously for example orthodox church will change for orthodox dominant countries uh for example for japan you won't have armed forces you will have some like samurai or shogunate i believe right i think landowners in russia are called something else so there's a little bit of local flavor but generally speaking broadly you have these eight interest groups so what are they? They're kind of a collection of ideologies, right? Together with a leader, uh, which has his own ideology, which overrides or complements, uh, you know, or adds to, right? The ideologies supported by uh, a certain interest group. And these ideologies, they're kind of, you know, their view on the way of life and the way a, a country and kind of their country, since they're obviously an interest group in Portugal, should be run, right? The way that is kind of modeled in game is that they either oppose or endorse certain laws or they just don't care about them, right? And that is again. So, for example, some, right, say, I don't know who, petite bourgeoisie are, um, let's say, patriotic, meritocratic. They are reactionary. They endorse monarchy and theocracy, right? This group is nostalgic for a past, real or imagined, where just kings ruled over a uniform society, right? They like national supremacy. And they strongly endorse migration control. So they don't want people to move around. They want to superioritize the Portuguese culture under a strong monarch, right? They are reactionary. That's just how they are. Now, there are other groups that can actually be reactionary. I don't think there are any right now, but there can be leaders who are reactionary. Uh, right? But then, the, so they kind of have their views on, let's say, sort of citizenship, governance principles, and migration. They have a set of views, yeah, meritocratic at the same time. So, for, on bureaucracy, their view is, you know, we should pass elected bureaucrats. That's how the country should be run. They endorse per capita and proportional taxation. And they actually oppose land-based taxation. So they, they don't want to tax the peasants. They think it's kind of wrong. This group believes success is earned and that those who have achieved it deserve their accompanying res responsibility and wealth. Um, so they kind of, I guess, want more tax revenue for the government, tax more of like all of the lower strata, uh, or pretty much everyone. They want everyone to contribute. And this is where you know, each interest group is a little bit different and has these ideologies. It is also led by a leader who can be kind of popular or hated, etc. And he has certain traits that uh, affect the group. For example, this guy is pious. For example, the leader of our petite bourgeoisie. He's pious. This character is known for, the, for their more spiritual beliefs that reflect a healthy body and soul. So you have 5% political strength of clergyman as agitator, as a ruler. Okay, these don't really matter since he's not an agitator or ruler. As commander, he also gives some bonuses. He's not a commander, though. So these kind of literally don't matter. He's a political operator, however. This character has certain knack for politics. So let's have a look at him. Tiago Ferreira. Um, so, so he's a political operator, and that means as interest group leader, which he currently is, he gets plus 5% interest group political strength. All uh, right, so that's very good for us, since our petit bourgeoisie are just relatively stronger, whatever cloud they have which is determined by how many pops support them right let's see from wealth and how wealthy those pops are right because right now we don't have any voting what really matters and well who governments listens to are the wealthy pops so they listen to you know whoever supports this gets an extra bonus of five now among these 
uh, sort of eight groups, right? All the political strength in the country, which means all pops who are politically active, which means they they have a political view, right? Because many people just don't care. In fact, the start the majority of our population just doesn't care about politics. But those that do care, take their political strength, which as I have just explained, is dependent on their wealth and align it to a certain interest group. That creates political clout, right? Political strength. And in the first episode, if we look at our population charts, right? This is our population and this is a political strength. Aristocrats, tiny portion of population, 50% of our political strength. Why? Because they are wealthy, right? And what's important is that increasing the standard of living, which is a representation of wealth, uh, increases a pop's political strength exponentially, right? So going from standard of living of five to six, uh, and then six to seven is not a linear increase. You don't get sort of like zero plus 0 0.1, right? What you get, if we look at detail list, let's say laborers with a, okay, I mean, well, let's say struggling, right? Which is where they should be not struggling, but at least not starving, but at least struggling. They get, we only get 0 0.15 uh, political strength per pop, per politically active pop. If we go to even uh, nine, right? These are struggling, these are still laborers, but just their better standard of living. They get four times. So we go from five to nine, but they get a political political power of 0 0.6 per pop, right? If we go to a standard of living of anything, let's say farmers, and let's say we have here, you know, something like 14, they immediately jump to 2.4 per politically active pop at 14, right? If we go from 14 to 15, all right? Okay, the, well, these guys suffer from um, discrimination, so they don't really matter. But they say impoverished Portuguese. Sorry, we were at 14, now we need 15. We need to find someone. 15, they got Portuguese, Madeira, farmers. Well, they're unincorporated, I guess. But still, but, it, but the penalty comes after, but they do get 4.6, right? 4.6 for just one level increase, but they get 4.6. If we take someone with 16, they go ewer. Okay, well, these guys will obviously be discriminated against. But regardless, actually, we can ignore the bonuses, or well, sort of malices as they're applied afterwards, but they gain 6.8 per wealth, right? So you can see how from 14 to 15 to 16, it decreases exponentially. Now, at, at extremes, we can get shopkeepers with wealth of 22. They gain 26 political power per wealth. Per pop, per, 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 pardon me. Right? And if we take, you know, the guys that are making a killing of fishing wharves or even, where are those guys in logging camps, right? These guys have massive political power. So it not only matters what jobs you create, but how wealthy do you make those pops as well. So they get 89 Right, so these four thousand guys, four thousand, well, not yeah, so four thousand shopkeepers that work in logging camps in Beira have massive political strength, and they mostly support petite bourgeoisie, right, seventy-five percent. So we got to be mindful of that as we build buildings, we build up our economy. Yes, we wanted to do what it, we wanted to do, right, produce certain goods, increase our GDP, put our, you know, create jobs for our uh, pops. We tax them, we get wealth, we can build up our army or uh, Navy, project our power overseas, right? Do the, that thing, but it does affect the politics of the country and which interest groups receive that clout. Uh, so that is what matters. Each interest group has some ideologies. It has the clout. Um, and yeah, they can be in opposition or they can be in government. Now, as I said, they have ideologies, which means they endorse or oppose certain laws. The laws they endorse, we still can't enact them. In order to be able to enact a law, and you can see here, this little number kind of says we have two available alternatives, right? Uh, what that depends on is which interest groups are in government. So if we included petite bourgeoisie, we can now attempt to pass laws that they support, right? But without them in government, we simply cannot. Now, from outside of government, i.e. being in opposition, they can actually start a political movement to enact a certain law as well. So kind of try to pressure the government from opposition. That depends how powerful they are, etc. Um, now also, there's a difference you see here, marginalized interest groups. That is kind of any, any interest group below 5% clout drops down to being marginalized. And what that means is that basically 
they well yeah i guess what their difference is they can't activate these traits so they, their approval of that interest group no longer matters right whereas anyone above five percent cloud becomes at least goes into opposition and we can then include them into government because we can't include uh marginalized groups into government although a group in government can become can drop their cloud to less than five percent and as long as we don't remove them from there it can actually uh linger there indefinitely um but otherwise, we can't include marginalized interest groups in government and their approval does not activate, doesn't really matter because it doesn't activate their traits. Now, what are traits? This is a separate mechanic of interest group approval. So not only does it have clout, right? That just means how many people support this interest group. It all, there's also a gauge of just how eager the, the pops that are supporting this interest group are, right? And that depends on whether they're radical or loyalist. They're either eagerly hating the government and they're radical and if there are enough of them they produce enough disapproval here we'll talk about that in more detail as well to activate one negative trait that they have and that gives us some sort of malice for example if the petit bourgeoisie were really angry with us they would activate this and that would give us a 10 percent penalty to influence and 25 percent radicals from discrimination if however they were loyal and and uh then they would activate the traits of middle managers and then later treasury bonds giving us 10% bureaucracy extra and my Simpson loan interest, both very good for us. Now, how do we get radicals and loyalists? Uh, the way this happens is through increases or decreases in standard of living. So whenever we have a pop and maybe it, it creates a new job or its building becomes more profitable and it earns a higher wage, it then spends that wage on its needs according to that the standard of living that it's at like five or six but it's it saves the rest of money in order to build up some wealth and over time it will actually uh, upgrade effect or move up the kind of chain and start living a better life and start increase its standard of living uh, as that happens you know on the upside right whenever there's 100 pops increase their standard of living they, there's a 30 percent kind of in fact, not a chance, but 33% of them, I think, that's the base value, or around there, 30% will become loyalists. So some people kind of, you know, won't really show you any gratitude. In fact, the majority, 60% will just take it as a given. But some will give, be kind of become more loyal to the government, right, and, and to their interest group, and they will re improve, increase their approval, and potentially activate one of these traits. Now, on the way down, if there was some economic shock. Or, as I said, for example, if we change production method, that would effectively remove some part of the workforce, and that means they lose in standard of living. Then, of every 100 pops that lose or decrease their standard of living, um, six, about 66% or something like two-thirds of them would actually become more radical. Again, I don't actually know. Maybe those numbers have changed with patches, but it's roughly that amount. So you definitely always get fewer loyalists uh, on the way up, then you get fewer, and then you get radicals on the way down, right? Obviously, people tend to be skewed towards complaining rather than showing gratitude. I think that's just human nature and that's the way it's represented in the game. All right. And so increasing standard of living by building our economy makes our pops more loyalist, which means they support their interest group more eagerly. And that means we they activate these extra traits from approval. And we'll talk about the precise kind of numbers and details probably now in the next episode. But that is broadly kind of the interest groups there are eight of them right less than five percent cloud they become marginalized more than five percent they are at least in opposition and then we can include them in government if we want to we'll talk about government i guess also in the next episode um loyalists and uh radicals depend on increases or decreases in standard of living it's easier to gain radicals than loyalists right more people become radical as they lose standard of living than actually become loyal on while well, in increasing standard of living it is also important that you know increasing the standard of living of a pop that is currently radicalized will also make it more loyal but it will not make it loyalist it will move it up to being neutral and away from being radical right similarly if a pop is was loyal but its standard of living goes down it actually goes down one level only and it becomes neutral uh sort of you know, uh, away from being loyalist to neutral but it doesn't get radicalized straight away but if you are neutral you will either go loyalist or radical now we're kind of out of time here, so let's cut the episode here, guys. But in the next episode, we will look over our government and understand legitimacy, how that works, why is it so low, how to form a government and why, and you know, potentially look at laws, how to pass them, and what laws we might want to pass now or soon. 
yeah, a big topic. Uh, again, guys, I know we only unpaused for four weeks, but there we are. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the very start, the first four episodes are going to be quite slow, but we're going to go over, you know, these are really, this is the core of Victoria 3, right? It was the economics that we discussed in previous episodes and kind of general overview of country. And now we've come to politics, another core. So it's probably another episode, another slow episode ahead. And then we'll unpose and actually get on with our journey to greatness. But I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. Give it a like if you have. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.